Philippians chapter 1, verses 9, 10, and 11 today. And <clears throat> are any of you familiar with conversational prayers? What that might mean. What, what does it mean when you say conversational prayer? No. Okay. Got me on that one. No. Nope. Well, thinking about the prayers, would you say that the Lord's Prayer, which is the disciples' prayer, is that a conversational prayer or is that a more formal prayer? It follows a particular form or pattern. Sounds formal. formal. Okay. So we understand that, that it follows a particular form or pattern. But if uh, most of us were told when we were younger, bow your head, close your eyes, and fold your hands. Why was that? Preference. Okay, preference. That's one. What's the practical reality of telling your kids to do that? If their hands are folded, they're not doing other things with them. If their eyes are closed, they're not looking around seeing what mischief they can get in. We were told that there was an attitude or a physical position or something for prayer. Uh, the Bible tells us on your face, in your closet, uh, there are numerous positions where you deliberately get any position that facilitates prayer. The position doesn't do anything uh, in some churches. Our churches don't happen to have them. Some churches have kneelers. Mm -hmm. You fold down a kneeler and you get any position for prayer or worship. Um, we have a position for reading the Bible. We say, would everyone please stand while we read God's word? That comes from the Old Testament. It's a sign of respect. And so there are, there are formal positions. But Paul, in this case, is talking to friends that he's he was the founder of the church 10 years ago 10 years before and he's had open communication with them over the time but something special has happened that paul did not usually allow uh, epaphrodite shows up with a monetary gift because paul is in prison now who knows what a bivocational minister is i used i i'll tell you it's paul what does, it, what does it mean to be a bivocational minister? Had a day job and then you preached. Like yes. So you are a pastor and then also you work. Now, what was Paul's line of work? Tent maker. Tent maker. Okay. Which, uh, yeah, well, leather, work, leather worker. So, yeah, which tents or whatever. But so Paul, in most cases, said, I support myself. I do not, I'm not a burden on a church. Now, I can tell you that I spent a number of years as a bivocational pastor. So I served in smaller churches that couldn't afford a pastor and his family and the insurance and the retirement and, and, and. And so I was a bivocational. I had, I used to kid some of my peers. I said I had a real job. And, uh, <laughs> but anyway, uh, because, Paul said, I do not want to make a burden. I, I have the right to charge you, but I'm not going to. And he deliberately would not take money. But in this case, he is in prison in Rome. And this particular time, he doesn't know if he's going to get out or not. He doesn't know what's going on for sure. But Epaphrodite shows up and says, the church at Philippi wanted to send you something to help you while you're here. And Paul writes back to them. And it's basically a letter of encouragement and gratitude. Now, let me ask you something. Is Paul in a comfortable place to write from? No. no. Where is he? No, I don't think so. No, it's not. The prison there was not air conditioned with a law, with a law library. No, it was not. It's usually down in the basement <clears throat> with four-legged animals running around, and it was not comfortable. But Paul is concerned to encourage the church in Philippi. And he has been encouraged because he hadn't had any communication for a while. He kind of, I wonder if they still think of me. I wonder if they still remember me, whatever. And then he get Ep Epaphrodite shows up and says, the church wanted to send you something because they so appreciate 
being partners with you in your ministry. Good morning, Frika. Welcome to our group. Uh, I'm Phil Stubbs. In case you didn't know, Pastor Dave's gone this week. He'll be back next weekend. And so Paul is wanting to encourage them in spite of his circumstance. And I, I want us to pick up just a few things out of this today because it's something that in his conversational prayer, in verse 9, Philippians 1, verse 9, he said, how does, how does he start that? And this is my prayer. And he's just talking to, he's, no, Timothy's writing it down. We, we think that Timothy's writing because Paul can't see well enough or something's happened that he cannot, he's not physically able to write his letters. So it's, it starts out Paul and Timothy. So Timothy is doing the writing. But Paul says, it is my prayer. And he, he just goes on and talks. And um, are any of you from a more formal liturgical church where your prayers are read? Anybody, anybody here from a, a church where you used to, you had a book of common prayer in the pew and your prayers were read? No. Okay, you're, you're all Baptist then. Okay. Uh, <laughs> but is there anything wrong with a red prayer? No. Okay, oh, Tom, you said no, and I, I thank you for that. Why did you say? Why did you say no? This is a, this is supposed to be not a lecture series. Okay, uh, why did you say no? You didn't think there was anything wrong with a red prayer? Um, well, I mean, some of the Psalms are prayers, so if yes. we read them, we're praying, and I don't think there's anything wrong with thinking through what you want to pray, so writing it down and or appreciating what people have thought through in, in centuries before. Okay, Tom has been in the position of being at the front of the church, opening the service, reading a scripture, and praying. Some people are very uncomfortable being in front of other people, and they will write out exactly what they want to say because they're afraid their mind will go blank the moment that they get there. And, uh... <laughs> so they will write the prayer out. The well, reason... that's... I, I, I guess it depends on whether that is your prayer uh, or somebody else's prayer. In other words, in other words, God reads your heart. Okay, so the the fact that there there's nothing wrong with reading a prayer as long as it says what you want to say. Uh, exactly. When I when I was a pastor. Somebody asked me one time, why don't you use the Lord's Prayer in every, every Sunday? I said, because it becomes so familiar, you don't have to think. You use our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy and, and it didn't do anything. You didn't right. think about it. It wasn't something you wanted to say at the time. It was just, that's where this fits in the service, so we'll say the words, you know. And I said, to me, prayer is supposed to be my communication with God, and then God communicating back with me. And that's not necessarily an automatic, it fits certain, in a certain spot in the bulletin. Right. And so and the same thing is true of liturgy. Uh, liturgy can be wonderful. And I know most Baptists are not familiar with it, but there are uh, several different ones. And as long as liturgy is saying what's in your heart or what speaks to your heart, it's valuable. It's just like a sermon that if it doesn't connect with you, what was the point? I had a pastor years ago that said, if I don't put handles on it so you can carry it out the door and use it, I wasted your time and mine. And so yeah. nice picture. <laughs> yeah. So we look at that, we look at that and we say, hey, uh, you know, this is supposed to be something that touches us deeper than sitting in a room. And Paul addresses that right here as he starts in verse nine and he says, and it is my prayer that your love, he has, he has seen their love in action. Now, I want to break down love for a moment because we have all kinds of words. I love chocolate ice cream, and I love Florida weather more than I like North. I love, love, love. Let's break something down here a little bit and say that the Bible, the kind of love that he's talking about addresses a need. 
it addresses a need. Now you think about it, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, he addresses a need that will, if you acknowledge his son and you receive him, your life will be better. Your life will be much improved. So if I, uh, most of the people on here, most of you on here have uh, been in love. Uh, it's funny when it's younger people because they look like they're sick. <laughs> I'm in love, and they look like a, you know, it's it's something they caught, but love is a decision, according to the Bible, that God so loved, God commended His love toward us. It's a conscious decision, and so I want to lay this down for you, and then we'll go through it just real quick and see it. That love needs an object. It needs some kind of focus. You can't just walk around saying, oh, I love, love, love. There was a whole movement years ago about love and being a love child. And all that. You need an object. You need a subject. You need something to focus on. Because love is not just a feeling. Love is a decision. Then this object or subject that you are focusing on, you need to study it. Now, for young men, they picked out a young woman they thought they might be interested in, or the young woman picked out a young man, depending. Uh, understanding we can't be sexist these days. It goes both ways. Uh, but anyway, the, the idea that I think I'm interested in that person, and you begin to focus on that person, and you begin to study it, and you see if they are interested in you. And if they are, then you start pursuing that interest. But you have to have some someone or something to focus on. If you have a, uh, well, let's see, I have a I have a cup here that I was given uh, years ago when I served in the military. I was over in a country called Thailand, and they gave me this cup uh, from the station, the radio. T I was on radio and television at the time, and they gave me this cup and. Uh, doesn't look real good right now. It it's all brass. It's all engraved and all this sort of stuff. It okay. doesn't look that good. So if I were to decide I want to improve that cup, I would focus on it, and then I would see what kind of chemicals are what I need to clean up the outside and brighten it up and make it look better than it does now. I think that's what Paul's talking about. He's, Paul says, "I've seen some of the things you've done, and I'm impressed." I am really impressed. I've seen the result of your love because it caused you not only to study to see how can you help or improve the situation, but it also caused you then to take positive action to meet that need when there was an opportunity. There, had, there isn't always an opportunity to show love. Now, let me give you a short version. This sounds very complicated, but in church years ago, Many years ago, when my kids were small, <clears throat> we were in church. We were sitting towards the back because I wasn't feeling good. I I knew I needed to be there. It wasn't anything I was going to give anybody, but I just knew I needed to be there. But I was sick. And during the course of the worship time, one of the deacons or one of the ushers, whoever it was, I really don't, never found out who it was, in the back saw that I was not able to participate like other people were. And knowing me, during that time, they came up, laid their hands on me, and prayed for me that God would touch me so that I would be able to more fully participate in worship like the other people. And God did. To me, that was love. Because Amen. he saw somebody in need, identified the need, God needs to touch them because they're not doing well, and then took the opportunity when there was no embarrassment, everybody else is singing and praising the Lord, and walked up and prayed for me. Uh, it could be your child. It could be someone else that's just around you that you look at them and you see them. Uh, maybe they can't find the right place in the bulletin to fill in that word that's on the screen. Or maybe the word's not on the screen anymore, and now they found the place and don't know what the word is. It used to be, or maybe they pulled out a pew Bible 
a Bible out there and they don't know how to find what the pastor said, please turn to so-and-so and they have no idea where it is. It doesn't always have to be a long-term relationship. Sometimes it's a short-term thing of seeing a person and being able to focus on someone else other than ourselves. And that requires that God had put his love in us because we wouldn't have anything to share if he didn't put it in to start with. And then we look and see, well, is there somebody I can help? Maybe they just need somebody. Hey, you, ever, you ever walk around at the uh, at the greeting time and there's certain people that nobody ever walks up to? Nobody walks up to them and says hi to them. Well, there's a possibility of focus and there's a st- there might be a need there. Or somebody just needs a good word. Somebody needs a thank you or I'm glad you're here or something. So you take the positive action when there's opportunity to meet that need. Epaphrodites, uh, it cost him a lot to come there. It, he got sick, and then they had to send him back. And it was sick or dangerous. We don't know exactly what happened, but it cost him a lot to, to bring their gift. But as we look, he said, he said, it's my prayer that your love may abound more and more, about may grow, may spread. Uh, you know, there are people at church that just walk up to you and bless you. They just say, hi, I'm glad to see you. There's somebody... <laughs> I think there's a guy by the name of Doug that stands at the front door every once in a while. And he just opens the door and smiles and says, glad you're here, glad you're here today. I appreciate that. I would show up if Doug wasn't there, but I appreciate the fact that he is. Don't get the big head, Doug. I know you're here. Okay. <laughs> but I appreciate the fact you're out there. And you don't know, uh, once in a while, I get a chance. I stay at the door and thank people when, when they're leaving. And people, well, thank you. You know, just sometimes it's that simple. It's just that simple. But he says, he says, I want you to, and he said, one thing I want you to do, he said, I want you to use some knowledge and discernment. Why would you need knowledge and discernment to exercise love? Well, because because uh, the application that, that you want to make may be inappropriate. Ah, uh, yes. Now, let me ask you something. Uh, husbands don't raise any hands, but have you ever done something that you thought, I'm going to really show my wife how much I love her. And you've done something that really took effort, took time, took whatever, and they did not see it the same way you did. Incoming voice call from Pastor nope. Dave. Uh, pardon me just a moment here. Incoming voice call from Pastor Dave. Good morning, Pastor Dave. Oh, I'm on, I'm in the middle of the uh, Legends call. Can I call you back? <laughs> okay. It just said Pastor Dave. It was the church office. Okay. Uh, <laughs> but he... Is it possible to do something loving for somebody that they don't appreciate? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Now, wives did not respond to that, but husbands did. Yes, it is possible. <laughs> it's possible to go do something for somebody else. They, they just don't appreciate it as much as you thought it cost you and as hard as it was for you to do it. And you look for an opportunity and they just look at it and say, uh, well, uh. it's it's like it's like that uh, stinky cheese that I like. And and I buy it because I, I think that she would enjoy it, too. And once I unwrap it, you know, and I I see she gets up and walks away, <laughs> then I know that that my my idea of blessing her wasn't the right one. Okay, so not only do we need to focus on the object and study the object to see what is it they need, but we need to use some discernment and knowledge on not only what do they need, but how do, how does it need to be provided. Uh, we're not trying to create another problem. We're trying to improve their life. When you say, I love you, that means I want to invest my resources, energy, time, whatever, in making your life better. And that takes sometimes knowledge and discernment because we're not all alike. And what I think I need and what you think I need may not be the same thing at the same time. Uh, I had I had a neighbor here that, uh, I started into some of this uh, doctor stuff that's going on and all that, the medical stuff. 
brought us enough food for about three weeks. Well, um, I was the only one eating it and I wasn't eating that much. And, you know, he went to great lengths to cook all that stuff and make all this stuff, but I didn't need it all. I have another one that brought me some more. I said, please, no more food right now. Right now. I'm not eating right now. Don't, don't, no. Uh, which if you know me, if I'm not eating, I am. Okay. Uh, so it takes sometimes knowledge and discernment to properly show somebody that we love them and are trying to improve their life. Does that make sense? Yes. So he says, I want, he says, I want your love to grow. I, I want your desire to help other people grow, but use some sense. I, I will read this to you from the message afterwards, and you'll see what he did about it. And he said, in, in this process, verse 10, you may approve what is excellent. You are going to experience, as you share God's love, just by blessing another person, giving them a, a good day, give them a ride to the doctor, uh, you know, whatever it is, whatever it is. I've had a couple of people at church that give me rides to the doctor when they were going to do something that I should not be driving. And I'm used to giving other people rides. That's kind of difficult, but I needed it. I needed it. And they had the discernment to say, we can provide it. And I said, thank you. I appreciate that expression of love. But he says, in doing this, you will, you will approve what is excellent. And so be pure and blameless in the day of Christ. Filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory of praise of God. You ever think about Jesus Christ, who is the creator of all that is? He's the sustainer of all that is. And people look at him and say, eh, who cares? Don't like you. Don't want you around. Don't want you anywhere. And he still expresses love. That doesn't mean everybody receives it, but it does mean he expresses it. Now, for us, we need to focus in because we're not able to love uh, the whole world at once. We need to focus. We have a little more finite resource. But as you do, you experience what God's experiencing. Have you ever thought of that? You can experience what God is experiencing because God is loving. God is kind. And God wants to make your day, your week, your month, your rest of your life and all eternity better. And he's willing to invest resources. And Paul says, even though I'm locked up in prison here, I want to I want to offer a prayer today that you your love that you're you're exercising will just get bigger and bigger and bigger. And you would affect more and more people. And you will experience the life and the love of God and prove what is excellent in the process. I want to read this to you from the uh and oh, by the way, he said you give all praise to God in the process, too, because if any praise comes back, you praise God. Let me read it to you as Eugene Peterson said it for his youth group. So this is my prayer, that your love will flourish and that you will not only love much, but well. Learn to love appropriately. You need to use your head and test your feelings so that your love is sincere and intelligent, not sentimental gush. Live a lover's life. That means looking for opportunities to share love. Live a lover's life. Circumspect and exemplary. Doing it properly. A life Jesus will be proud of. It's like his. Bountiful and fruits from the soul. Making Jesus Christ attractive to all. Getting everyone involved in the glory of and praise of God. So in the process of doing this, we involve people in the glory and the praise of God. And God is honored, and God is glorified. And guess what? You've just experienced something God wants us to experience, of sharing his love, allowing it to pass through us into other people. So whether it's somebody next to you needs a smile, needs a hug, needs help finding their spot in the Bible, needs uh, thank you for coming today, or needs more. As we share what God has given us and poured in our hearts by the Holy Spirit, we will experience God's move. And we need to tell people, by the way, I love you because God loves you. God always has. 
and he always will. Let's give him the praise and the glory. And all of his people said, Amen. Amen.